Check one, two, check. Ladies and gentlemen, live from the nation's capital, it's the Coffee and Biscotti Show. I'm your host, Crew Mel Bellissimo. Today is Friday, April 1st, also known as April Fools. I don't know if we're going to have April Fool jokes today, my friends, but happy April Fool's Day to all of you. I hope there's some pretty cool pranks out there that uh, you are making uh, people's lives uh, better by having to having them smile today. It's uh, just past 12 o'clock Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And uh, I got a show for you today, my friends. I'm super excited uh, for today's show. I got myself all freshened up for my guest today. It's... um. This is going to be an emotional show for me. Emotional because I would ask all of you, if you if you were in the chat right now, who could you write down? What name would you put down in the chat? Of someone that you could say had a major influence in your life. Someone who maybe inspired you or motivated you to do something. Or in my case, someone who gave me some tools to be able to reflect as a young man in my 20s and use these tools to help identify what are some of these superpowers, these God-given talents that we all have, but that are specific to us. And being able to use these tools so that I can go out and make myself a career. Thank you, Putin Nation. I'm sure you're looking equally as spiffy wherever you are, my friend. Thank you, as always, Mr. Josh Leslie, for being here. I am... I'm particularly connected to the story today, not just because of who this young woman is. I'm connected to her, of course, but I'm connected to her story because you're going to hear about a woman who decided to make a career change in her 40s. Well, my friends, I can't tell you that... (laughs) I love that she was able to share this with me. She shared this stories years ago. And I'll tell you that I could remember it almost verbatim, what she talked about, that I was so mesmerized by what this woman had to say. And here I am in my 40s going, geez, maybe there's a reason that this woman shared with me this story. There's some power behind the story. You know, I've been asked by many people when starting this clarity coaching business um, to become a clarity and accountability coach. You know, Mel, you have, to, you have to know your market. You have to know who you want to serve. You have to be specific about a particular problem. And everybody has advice for me about what the fuck I need to do in my life. So I decided to I decided to really go inside and try to use the same tools that this woman gave me to over 20 years ago. And what I've come up with is I want to work with, with men and women uh, in their 40s, 40s and 50s, you know, that, that age bracket because there's a lot of changes that happens when you're in your 40s. 
I think that for some people, they've maybe worked in a career for 10 or 15 years and decided that, you know, this was somebody else's narrative. Somebody told them they would be good as a salesperson, so they decided to go in sales. They made some decent money, and they stayed there only to wake up one day and say, holy shitballs, I really hate this job. And so they decided that it was time for change. But the change comes at a time where maybe you have a family. Maybe you're on your first divorce. Maybe you're on your second divorce. But you're in a time where taking the risk to go and attempt a new career is so flipping hard because there's so many other factors in your life. When you're 20 and if you don't have any dependents, you're like a free bird, you know? You can try different things. You can risk a little more. And then you get into your 40s and like me, I have a little four-year-old little monkey who is the apple of my eye, who I love with all my heart. And I think to myself, the, the pull, the battle, you should see the battle of the monkey brain and the heart, how they pull at each other. Yes, I want to do what I want to do because I know that I'm working within my zone of genius. And then the mind saying, listen, you idiot, you got to make a living. Shut up, go do a J-O-B and just do what you got to do because you have a family and people are going to laugh at you and criticize you and say all these things about you because you need to go find a job and you're not doing that. The battle is incredible, my friends. In fact, it's so incredible that it feels like a five round Muay Thai fight. That at the end of 15 minutes of fighting, you are absolutely knackered from dumping all of your energy into this battle. I share this with you because my guest today is one of the most influential women of my life. A woman that I met in a class at Seneca College in 1996. Some of you who are probably in the chat were born after 1996. <laughs> and yet, here we are on April 1st of 2022. And I have the sincere pleasure of introducing the world through the Kavi and Biscotti show the most amazing woman that I have ever met in my life. She is a beautiful goddess who maybe in the times of, 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 of the Egyptian civilization would have been at the top of the food chain in education. That they, she would be revered for what she does for the world. She has dedicated her life to helping students. Yeah, making students realize their own potential. I'll tell you this because it was one of the things that I had never experienced in a class before. You walk in to the class. And the first thing that this lady says to you is, is okay, folks, here's what we're going to do today. Today, you are going to act out your name, almost like a game of charades. I want you to act out your name. And I went, what the heck am I, what are we doing my friends, if I told you that in that moment that we did this exercise in that class, everybody would know everybody's name because of the silliness and the ridiculousness that we did in front of everyone, gotten completely outside of our comfort zone to be able to stand in front of a class and act out our name so that we could somehow demonstrate to them what this name is. 
She's an innovator in education. She's won so many awards and has taught so many years that to list them, I would have to have another show called Awards and Courses by Dr. Celia Karsten. <laughs> I don't have that time to talk about all the different awards and all the different things. She retired, if I'm not mistaken, is from Seneca at 2007 and continues to teach online at OISE at the University of Toronto. She, she, I don't know, guys. I don't know what to say. The truth is, is, is that everybody needs this kind of woman in their life to help you and steer you in the right direction, to get you to reflect on your own life. Because she knew that the answers were inside of us. All she did was provide you some tools so we could pull them out. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, wherever you are in the world, get off of your comfortable seat and put your hands together for the beautiful goddess, Dr. Celia Karsten. Mm. And the crowd goes wild. All right. Well, I go wild because of that introduction. <laughs> I mean, uh, what an opportunity you've given me. I, I, it's a real honor to be here. Well, I mean, we've, we've been friends pretty much all the time since yep. you walked into my classroom. Um, we've, we've, gone through a lot of really good talks together and work together, looking at your life, helping you with an eight portfolio, things like that. Yeah. But before we get too far into this situation, and I, <laughs> I have now had to reflect on a lot of years, um, because I was born seven days before Pearl Harbor was bombed. Yes, that makes me 80 years old. <laughs> and, um, wow. I wanted to talk just for a minute about that poster. It's a glorious poster that you put up about my being on your show today. Yes. And I want people to know that that painting is a portrait that was done of me. My friend Jessica had has had a few exhibitions, and she had one exhibition which in particular was about portraits. And I was, I felt really flattered that she wanted to do one of me and, and she put it in the show. Her name is Jessica Mann, M-A-A-N, which means moon <laughs> in Dutch. Anyway, if you go to jessicamon.com and you know how to spell Jessica, I hope, it's all one word, jessicamon.com. Mr. Leslie, can we get that up in the chat? Is that possible? I think it's really wonderful if um, you can have a chance to go and look at all of her paintings because she doesn't just do portraits, although she does lots of those and they're very good. And you might know someone in your life or have a pet or a place where you've been and you want her to paint it for you. She takes commissions. But let me get going here because there it I is, uh, Celia, for you for the world, the world to see, JessicaMan.com. Thanks, thanks for that. And while you're putting up um, links, you may as well go ahead and put up the link to my website because tons of things are there. Because I've been um, I've been working on that website since about the same time that we met, Mel. Yes. And I'm going to talk about, first of all, my early years, because um, I've just been reflecting a lot in order to do the show for you today. Um, I was, my, in my early years, I was in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. My dad was manager of the Majestic Hotel and Spa, which was right at the critical point in that town. It's a town that has two mountains and three lakes, and it's 
in the 40s, it was the hot place to be. Um, a racetrack, gambling, auction houses, you name it. Um, uh, one of the delightful events for me was, I mean, I, I couldn't go to the races. I was too young. But I loved horses. And so when Anheuser-Busch, on his train, came down from St. Louis, I was invited to have dinner with my favorite foods in his dining car to compensate for the fact that I couldn't go and uh, do anything more than just look at the Clydesdales. Uh, but anyway, okay, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Hot Springs. Um, there's a, it's a huge hotel, um, two restaurants, um, two massive lobbies. Lots and lots of people came down from Chicago, St. Louis, and places like that for the heyday. Um, I was in grades one through three. Um, Curly, who was the the doorman for the Majestic, became the chauffeur. Uh, my dad had a Buick he bought from Bill Clinton's stepfather. It was a Clinton Buick, and um, he took me to and from my my school, which is called Ramble School. I loved my teachers so much because my parents were really busy workaholics. My dad running this big hotel with all these people and the celebrities who came to do entertainment and all the rest of it. My mother was interior decorator and she was always busy all the time. I, when I was at home, I was with my nanny, my nanny Lydia, and she's the one who taught me how to dance and <laughs> how to have fun. My parents gave me lots of books and usually books that were in series, the Bobsy Twins, the Honey Bunch books, the Little Maida books, the Wizard of Oz books. Um, but a time came right at the end of the third grade. I was sent to live with my grandparents. That's because my parents were not getting along too well. And it was quite, um, a big deal to me, of course, um, because when I started going to Fairview Elementary, I didn't know anybody. I had no friends, but I had an art teacher and I had a social studies teacher, Miss Alta Stewart, and uh, for some reason we bonded and she asked my grandparents if I could be sent to St. James Country Day School it was a dream come true for me. I mean, um, I went went by bus out into the country every school day, and it was a big estate. It was a creek. I had tadpoles. I started a worm farm, <laughs> and the classes were really small. And I, I had this dream. I wanted to go to an Ivy League school, and I thought that with the education I was getting there, that that would not be a problem. Yale, Stanford, you name it. Alas, at the end of that school year and that summer, my mother died in a fire. And my grandmother went into a sort of long day's journey into night morning mode. Um, and unfortunately, the sixth grade was just a block away from her home. So I went into the public school system. Once again, I don't know anybody. <laughs> But there I am, and um, I, I, I didn't know my mother well enough to really mourn, um, and my father was now far away. He'd moved to California. So I think the first really exciting thing that happened for me was I was sent to camps a lot, and at Camp Joy Zell, I got to be an actor for the first time. I played a countess whose pearls had been missing. Age 13, my first acting class. Um, and I, I, I just got really excited about acting. I joined two Girl Scout troops. I, I sang in choirs. I was in a senior play, um, I, an operetta. I was learning Spanish. I learned French. English teachers were the best. They were absolutely the best. They were my surrogate mothers. <laughs> um, I, I, I had to work and 
at the end of high school, I got a job in an art store. I was lifeguard at the country club, um, but I was a lifeguard and I did synchronized swimming and I love to go camping. Um, I was the Arkansas delegate for the National Girl Scout Convention in Philadelphia. I mean, because of all those activities, because of Girl Scout leaders and teachers, I had the kind of support and caring and love that I was so needy for, you know, um, because my, my grandmother never really recovered from the death of my mother. And um, she didn't want me to have anything to do with my father. So he could send me a card at Christmas or on birthdays, but that was it. Anyway, um, I excelled in school, National Honor Society, and I went on to the University of Arkansas where I got my Bachelor of Arts in Speech and Drama. Um, I always loved art as a kid. And, um, you know, I was given painting teachers and uh, I was always drawing and, and stuff. And I thought I was going to be an artist one day. <laughs> the drama part really worked for me because not only could I act, but I could design sets and costumes and use all my, my art yearnings. I started getting involved in little theater. Um, I think I was Mrs. Van Damme in The Diary of Anne Frank was one of my first roles out of high school. Um, in Gulfport, I, Man Who Came to Dinner, I did the Betty Davis part. Um, in Great Falls, Montana, I, I helped to start a, a storefront theater and I was acting in it as well as directing and helping them to produce plays. In Seattle, the same thing. I, I, I did my practice teaching in Seattle because I got my teaching certificate in Great Falls, Montana. And then when I got to Seattle, I was able to do um, supply teaching. It's no fun being a supply teacher for a drama teacher because they all have big personalities and are lots of fun. And I'm like a warden who comes in and everybody just wants to give me a hard time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see that. But with my practice teaching, I had taken a group of students. Um, it was a Catholic high school. And so I chose to do um, a Catholic play, <laughs> which had lots of lots of kids in it. And we went to the state competition and we won all kinds of awards. So I, I felt like, you know, um, I, I was making some really good decisions when it came to teaching. But now I, ha I had a sports car fantasy all through high school. I really, really wanted a Aston Martin DVR2 or, you know, something with French headlights, something really sexy. And um, I, I inherited some money. Um, this was just around the time that Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, that's how I can remember the dates. It was November. Um, and I, I went to Seattle and Tacoma, and I, I went to the Porsche place. I thought, that's what I want. I want a Porsche. But when I walked in, the young men, salesmen, were so busy chatting among themselves, they didn't even look up at me. And I have to tell you, I was pretty gorgeous in those days. <laughs> if I say so myself, I'd lost about 70 pounds and I was sleek as the car that I ended up with. Because I walked out of that place, I thought, man, if they can't even look up and sell me a car, what's gonna happen when I've got the car and I need service? Next door, was um, there was an XKE British Race and Green 4.2 liter sitting on the showroom floor. I got in it and the manager taught me how to double clutch. <laughs> and I drove that car, which looks like um, it looks like it's moving when it's standing still. It is cooler than mentholated ice cream. Uh, it just, it was a fabulous car. I had a crate of castrol in the trunk and I drove it 
all across North America to New England, and then down the East Coast and through the South and back up. And um, I was back in Seattle about to spend some time with the manager of a car dealership. <laughs> and I came out of a restaurant having lunch and someone had creamed one whole side of the car. Um, I was a bit disappointed to say the least. But um, I got in the car and there's a there's a freeway between Seattle and Tacoma. And I pushed it red past, right past the red line. I mean, uh, about 160 miles an hour. The car was just shaking because the rear end really isn't built for that kind of speed. And I took it back and said, I'm trading this in. I mean, I've already lost 40% of the price of the car anyway. And I got an MGB, which I drove for the next 12 years. Um, it's pretty low to the ground, so I replaced a lot of exhaust systems. But I <laughs> used that story in teaching at Seneca because I was I I also taught a, I I created lots of courses, but one of the courses that all the students needed was how to succeed in college. And one of the things they needed to know was how to listen and take notes. So I told them this story. I told them about how the, the fan belt broke in the mountains in Arkansas. And I had to use substitute fan belts until I could get to Fort Worth because 80% of the parts were back ordered on the XKE in those years. And then I would give them a quiz and they would try to remember the story. But because so many of the marketing students were guys, terrific guys, just like Mel. <laughs> Not as terrific as Mel, but anyway, that was, a, that was just, it served me as a teaching device. It was a, a semi-disaster in my life, but it worked as a teaching device. Um, I guess the next big thing that happened for me was, um, you know, we, we, we had other assassinations, Martin Luther King, um, for example, there was a war going on. And so, you know, that expression, love it or leave it. I decided to leave it. Um, I had a holiday in Vancouver and I met a guy and I ended up fishing off the West coast of Vancouver Island. Um, that's quite a change. When you're in a tiny fishing village, which is only accessible by logging roads when they aren't logging or by boat. Um, and I began exploring things like yoga and meditation and what was reincarnation. And Jess, Jess Stern wrote a book called Yoga, Youth and Reincarnation, which was uh, a great way to get going on it all. Um, I got initiated into a meditation society in Victoria. I was given a mantra and meditating became a really important and powerful part of my life, getting through all kinds of ups and downs. I ended up in Vancouver at the Vancouver Playhouse Theatre Company. Um, I started off as receptionist, then I was production secretary. And then I was secretary to the director. Then I moved into costume department. And I, I was a, a wardrobe mistress who took a play, Treasure Island, to Ottawa. But when I got there, wardrobe mistresses had to be in a union and I wasn't in a union. And so all I got to do was stand backstage and help Long John Silver across the stage because he had a peg leg. Um, <laughs> it was a it was a delightful trip, but I began to realize that if I really wanted to get anywhere with theater, I needed more education. So, I I decided I didn't I couldn't afford Vancouver, but I had been offered a full scholarship at the Dallas Theater Center. And by the way, if you're in Dallas, 
look at the building. It was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And it was three amazing, wonderful years where I got to be an actor, a director, designer of sets and costumes and all those wonderful things. I had previously wanted to get my master's in directing in Seattle. But at this time, I thought it was better just to return to Vancouver and get lots of work. You know, I'd, I'd taken out a loan, I think, uh, altogether $3,000 while I was in school because I was so busy at the theater all the time, I couldn't work when I was in school. Well, I have to tell you, if you can possibly get through school without having to take out loans, you'll be a really happy person. <laughs> Good luck nowadays, right? Because the interest is what kills you. Mm. It's, it's, it's just too much. Um, anyway, during that time, I visited a friend in New York, and I, I sat in his antique store for him. It was called Methuselah on Bleecker Street in New York. And I was told about an astrologer, and the astrologer gave, told me that I should go certain places on my half birthday, which is May the 31st. But even more important, I went to a psychic. And the psychic said, you must go to Toronto. And he said, I don't understand. You're in theater. I don't understand why my guides are not telling me New York, LA, London. They insist that you go to Toronto you're going to win lots of awards. You're going to teach on the radio. Uh, well, mm. <laughs> and you clearly I, didn't want to come to Toronto. <laughs> no, I didn't. In fact, I, you know, I I went back. I went to Vancouver because that's where I knew I could get work. Um, I, I I taught at Simon Fraser. I taught yoga for actors. Um, I was designing for different theaters around town. I was doing jobs like stage management. I was doing anything in theater that I could think of. So, so yeah, I, I just I just want to I just want to unpack a little bit of this because what's what's most amazing is first of all the the incredible detail that you remember. I don't remember what I did what I had for breakfast yesterday. I mean, it's really quite quite remarkable, but what I want to know is is that you did so much moving around. And you visited so many places. Well, yes. Um, but the next, the next move was um, also fairly colossal. Um, when I left Dallas, I had three years in which to do a thesis for my Master of Fine Arts. The first proposal I made, I wanted to do one about what was happening with with the the coastal Indians, uh, uh, we, we, call, we call them Indians in those days. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I had spent a lot of time on the West Coast with fishing and that. And I had collected a lot of books about all the different tribes. And what alarmed me was how much they had been damaged by missionaries so that they could no longer do the potlatch ceremonies. And I wanted to write a play about it. I'd already written and produced a couple of plays. So I was eligible to write a play for my thesis. But my supervisor said, no, you can't do that. So, okay. I can't do that. <laughs> um, anyway, I ended, I ended up um, going to Europe to a friend of mine invited me to come to Europe. Uh, we got a car and we drove around, all around. England, Scotland, you name it, Switzerland, all those places. This is 1976. Well, unfortunately, when we were in Marseille, someone stole all of our luggage. Um, all I had was the clothes I was wearing and my purse. And fortunately, my passport 
and some American Express checks were in my purse. I was wearing a pony skin coat that I bought in Glasgow. <laughs> and I wore an orange turtleneck sweater and some um, dark green corduroy slacks for months. All through, um, all through Italy, Rome, Florence, you name it. Same outfit. Well, fortunately, we knew someone who was working for um, Olympic Airlines who lived in Athens. So we went to Athens. And he was leaving Olympic and going to Gulf Air. So now I have an apartment in the, one of the top neighborhoods in Athens, a basement apartment for $45 a month. And let me tell you, <laughs> I found ways to earn a living. Um, I had to get visas renewed all the time. But I taught, and I learned how to speak Greek. I used the alphabeticon. Moo moo, yeah, you love it. <laughs> meow meow, you got the Woof woof, you skilo. You know? Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. <laughs> right. And I, I, I figured out how to teach uh, my students, first I was telling them fairy tales, and then the next lesson they would have to remember how to tell it to me in English. And then I thought, oh, Celia, how stupid. They all know mythology. So teach them Greek myths in English, and already they will have inside of them those stories. Now they only have to tell the story in English and practice speaking English. Mm -hmm. I also cleaned apartments for Australians. Uh, who were working with the diplomatic corps. I did whatever I had to do. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was terrific. Anyway, um, when I got back to New York City... So I, how, so, sorry, how long did you stay in Athens, uh, Celia? Um, I was there and I, I had to go back to submit my thesis. And while I had been there, I... I wrote a play that I wanted to use as my thesis. My playwriting instructor had been giving me A pluses for the courses I'd taken from him, but he didn't like my play and he refused to chair. And his apostles also refused to chair. So I went to the director of the Dallas Theater Center and he said, look, you're really good at costume and set design. Give me a thesis about design. So, because I had read tons and tons of books, and I kept a journal, I had the names of all kinds of books that I had read in Greece, and I had this idea that you could, you could revive a classical play in contemporary times if you knew how to do it without just, you know, putting a toga on someone for a Greek play. How could you bring that play to life in modern times? So I came up with a theory that if you studied the culture that produced the play and you looked at three really important times in the history of that country and you used the elements of production for total theater, that you could really have a fabulous production. Hmm, yeah. Interesting. That was the formula. That was the formula. So I worked with um, what was left of a trilogy by the earliest Greek playwright called The Suppliant Women. And then Lord Byron was famous for adoring Greece, and um, he died during the Greek Revolution, not of fighting, but of pneumonia or something but anyway they they love him in greece and then there was henry miller henry miller was known for these really gritty novels which were act, actually forbidden for many to read tropic of cancer tropic of capricorn but when he went to visit his friend lawrence durrell who was living in corfu he got really excited about greece and he went through a transformation. 
it was an epiphany and he wrote a book called Colossus of Marusi. And this was around 39 or 40, just before the war, before the Italians um, and the, you know, the Germans um, tried to take over Greece. But anyway, it worked for my thesis. Um, and I could give you examples from the United States. You know, there's that play about witchcraft um, out of Salem. So if you wanted to produce that play, The Crucible, you could look at the United States during the time when the Watergate thing was happening or when they were having terrible troubles in Hollywood and they were banning lots of writers because they thought they were communists. If you took those three different periods and you looked at what was going on in the United States and you translated it into color, texture, silhouette, all those elements of production, that you could have a really exciting show. Mm. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting carried away with that. Um, meanwhile, I was hoping to go back to Greece. Um, I had an apartment uh, in the Palka, just below the the um, the famous uh, Acropolis. But there was a big earthquake, and I received news that there was too much destruction and that the apartment was not livable. So I thought, oh, what do I do now? Um, I still don't want to go to Toronto. So I went to the West Coast. <laughs> and um, my friend, Merry Christmas, was a friend that I'd helped come up from California to BC um, to be with the fishermen. And Mary was now living with Peter Christmas on a big farm in Roberts Creek, BC on the Sunshine Coast. And for 50 bucks a month, I had a cabin. It had an outhouse out back. Um, it did have electricity, a wood stove. I could go um, to the barn, get some wood, chop it, pump some water. <laughs> uh, it was pretty primitive. Um, but I started doing all kinds of artwork. And then I met Linda Cool. <laughs> she had just come back from a trip around the world with a guy who won the lottery for a for million dollars. Um, and she came for Peter's birthday party and we met. She came to my little cabin and she said, look, uh, I've got a big house across the road. I have to go back to being a log scaler. She was one of the first lady log scalers. And I need someone to look after my property. I had renters while I, were, I was gone. They, you know, it was a disaster. But I mean, I really need someone. And I said, that's great. I'll pay the utilities. You pay the mortgage. I'll take care of everything. And at the same time, I got work with the beachcombers which was being shot in Gibsons, B.C., nearby. Well, That's a I'm, famous show, famous Canadian show. Right. Well, the main work I got was stopping traffic every time they were filming. Sometimes I got to play minor parts or work on props or something. Um, but I decided that I would start a theater company. I mean, I've had all this practice. I've learned all these things. So I started Ensemble Theater, and um, I got the, the hall in Roberts Creek. And instead of using the stage at one, went, at one end of the room, I made theater in the round, uh, putting all the seating on the floor. So everyone had perfect sight lines. And I did two, two years of seasons of plays, created a musical. Um, it, it was a fabulous time. Wow. And Bill Jerusi, who was the lead in Beach Congress, said to me, you know, really, if you're serious about this theater stuff, you better go to Toronto. <laughs> Toronto! Okay, I give up. <laughs> and because, you know, during this time, at one point, I got down to $4 cash and my dad's credit card. And by this time, I had a rust paint and yellow 
Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> um, that that was sort of the lowest car situation that happened for me. But anyway, I got to Toronto. I immediately enrolled in acting classes, and I fortunately one of my acting partners was roommate to a man who lived here at the colonial apartments. He was a man who had, um, he, what, what is that disease where you turn yellow? <laughs> Jaundice? Uh, it, John. It, you can't work in a restaurant anymore if you've got it. Um, Anyway, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I just can't. What happens when you're 80 years old is you sometimes forget a word that you're looking for. And it'll come to me later. <laughs> right. Anyway, um, I went to the guy who was his roommate because he was moving out with a new lover. I went to his roommate who really wanted another gay roommate, but he was desperate because he was going to be on unemployment. He couldn't work until he got over this, whatever this condition was. Right. And so I took him to this roach ranch. Um, uh, I had rented a room and a house and I didn't realize until I turned on the lights the first night that it was there were roach casings everywhere. So, I mean, my stuff was, <laughs> my stuff was in a storage place not too far away. And I put everything into plastic bags um, so that nothing would get contaminated with roaches. And I invited him to, to come and see me there. And I said, look, Tom, this is an awful place to live. Can I be your roommate? I'll be good. I have lots of friends who are gay. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> anyway, we divided up this apartment. It was on the ground floor in the building, which adjoins the one I live in now. Uh, what I didn't realize was that he was prone to suicide. So he would come into my room late at night and say, look, um, I've just taken a whole bunch of stuff and I, I'm committing suicide. And then, of course, that we would be calling 911 and getting him to a hospital and getting him pumped out. And anyway, he was a really nice guy otherwise. <laughs> um, I'm, I got, I got, a, I got um, a talent person, and so I was looking for work. I, I was determined I didn't want to be a waitress or a barmaid or any of those kind of things. Um, Which so, goes hand in hand with being an actor. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I tried lots of things. I had lead in the play at Harborfront. Um, uh, I, I did a one-woman show based on a story by Gwendolyn McEwen, um, a leading uh, Canadian um, poet and writer. But for the job search, I thought, what can I do? So. Um, National Film Board, I went to their office and I saw who was the, the CEO. So I went to the library, the reference library, and I looked up everything I could find about this man. And I got an appointment and I went in with my resume. And I said, you know, um, I, I want to put together a book on how to get into show business in Toronto. And I, I really appreciate your advice. And then would you tell me someone else that I could also go to see about this? And could I tell them that you gave me their name? Well, uh, I made the rounds of Toronto with some really great people. Uh, <laughs> uh, and one of them called me and said, would you like a job? Um, they're doing a parenting show for CBC. It's a daily show, and the director needs an assistant. Would you be willing to do that? Oh, you bet. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. You can count on me. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so the parenting show was, a, you know, like it was a daily show. The hostess was um, Joyce. Uh, what's her life? She was married to David Suskind, but um, CBC knew her. Um, she had been sort of ostracized years before because she said something about the queen that nobody liked, but she was now back and she was a dynamite host for the show. And there was a segment in the show for five minutes called The Teacher in You. And it was about teaching parents at home how they could teach their kids activities and things to do at home. But the young woman who was doing that segment uh, was a Montessori teacher. She was very young and she was not very camera happy. Mm. So I went to the producers with my resume and I said, look, um, I'd be fine doing both, both being the assistant and I could do this. So they gave me a chance. I did 25 shows. Um, I wrote my own scripts had my own props, my own costume, my own makeup, my own, you name it. <laughs> and I got my actor card, which is a really precious thing to have. Except when they decided to do another season, they didn't hire me because they couldn't afford me. They couldn't afford to pay an actor, actress. So I, I was, I, I just, I went through this, period of time of you know I did I did get a couple more gigs but uh, a friend of mine who was also a friend of my suicidal friend said um, I think maybe you should talk to somebody about how you're feeling about all this and when I did the best suggestion that he made to me was make a list on the list, put everything you really like about being in this theater profession, acting and all that, and another list of all the things you don't like about it. Well, the things I didn't like about it, I mean, I hated rejection. I hate it when you went to a casting call and they said, you're too old, too young, too high, too tall, too fat, too whatever. And and you were only as good as the last gig that you had that anybody knew about. Well, one of the producers of the parenting show said, how about Seneca College? They need a creative drama teacher there. Would you be interested? Oh, would I be interested? Yes. Because that list of the things that I really liked were things about being creative, um, being in front of an audience, that energy. Well, guess what, folks? If you're a teacher, you have a new audience every single class, and you're performing however you need to perform to try to help those students. Whoa, this was a huge thing for me. I mean, uh, I, I can't tell you how important that was. I mean, I, I taught a number of courses for Seneca, and then I had the opportunity to work with the Futures program. At that time, they were worried about severely, severely employment disadvantaged youth. In other words, students, youth at risk. And in that program, there was continuous intake every week into your into your group and you were teaching job skills and life skills and it was a job and i had numerous sh kind of short-term contracts but then someone broke her leg her arm i can't remember what she broke but i got to be a regular teacher in the program and i began using all those wonderful things i learned as a in in, in drama school you know let's make a movie but then i had to learn about computers well you know you couldn't see any images on computers until 1995. there was a vp at seneca who took me into his office and he said look at this it was a mosaic browser out of hawaii and 
I went, oh my God, images on screen. Oh, this is really exciting. But you know, um, I'm completely untrained when it comes to uh, anything like computers or that kind of stuff. But uh, I got involved in doing playback theater, which was really important for these at-risk adolescents uh, because they came to me labeled learning disabled. And I said, no, 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 you're creatively gifted. Let's see if we can figure out what you're creatively gifted in doing or being. I want to take, I want to pause there for a second because yeah. well, I really love that. So here you are part of, and this is, this is sort of a separate entity to, to Seneca or was this a, a, a sort of program? No, it was, Seneca, it was Seneca College. It was Seneca. And they hired me to, to teach in the Futures Program. That's what it was called, the because Futures Program. Because children knew what the hell to do with these kids and they changed every week, you know, but I had them, you know, the vision boards that you do? Mm-hmm. I had them doing vision boards. I had them writing poetry. I had them making a newspaper. I had them making films. But I had to learn computers so that I could, I could um, edit what they were doing. I had to learn what was on the internet, what kind of games, what kind of activities would be helpful to them. Uh, yeah, you know, but what I want to say, Silly, is that I loved how you changed the words. They're coming to you to saying that these kids are, are what did you call them? Uh, they were learning disabled or learning? Learning disabled. They learning had, disabled. They had yeah. disabilities. The focus was on the disabled or disabilities aspect of them. I mean, whether they, they might have been geniuses, but they weren't doing what their parents wanted them to do. Or, I mean... Or maybe they had language difficulties. Maybe they just got off the boat. Or maybe they're a social worker or they're, uh, I don't know, some of them had cases because they had done something bad. I don't know. But I, I, I was also doing playback theater. And playback theater is where um, you can tell your story. You have somebody beside you who is helping you tell your story about an event in your life. And it might have to do with having a toxic family or with um, using illegal substances or a crime or something. Right, right. But when you told your story, you told it to a group of actors and you chose someone to play you and you chose other people to play other people who are in your story. Then you would play their story back to them and they could make a choice. They could repair the story. That is, they want to see it played again, making better decisions. Or they could do a big transformation about how, how they looked at life because they saw their story played back to them. Those kind of things were really helpful in the work. Genius! It, it was just amazing. Um, but Futures came to an end for those of us who are working for Seneca College because they figured out that they could pay people to do life skills and coach <laughs> coach people if they work for the Y. Well, I didn't work for the Y. I worked for Seneca. And all, I was the longest lasting, I would say, counselor because every time I got a break, I would second out to learn more about media, mixed media, and all those things I needed for teaching. And one of my chairs that I'd had at Futures was now a chair of the marketing program at Seneca. And she gave me a lifeline. She said, hey, Celia, I could use you in my department. Can you teach PowerPoint? I said, Are we talking yeah. about the lady that I know? Maureen Kennedy, Kennedy Baker. Kennedy Baker, exactly, right. exactly. And I said, yeah. no, uh, PowerPoint, I learned it in two hours one afternoon. I said, it's a really good thing to teach marketing students PowerPoint because they learn how to size pictures. They learn how to put the right color writing on the color screen or whatever. And if they learn how to do that, then they can make web pages. They can have e-portfolios. They can go into e-business 
um, because they can put up marketing stuff. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, that was just the first course that I created at Seneca. I created many, many more. Well, while I was there, I had I was really lucky that they appreciated the fact that I knew how to create a course. I that I would I would teach it, I would prove that it worked, and then I would help train a teacher to teach it after me. So uh, one of the things that I got to do there was they were put, doing a new program, a certificate program for teaching educators how to use the internet in their teaching. Well, I got to do the course on web-based learning and how to use anything to do with web, internet, to teach teachers how to, how to use that resource in their teaching. And um, I have here in my notes, computer applications, 1996, Mel comes to class. <laughs> Yay, but listen, before Yay. you go there, before you go there, Celia, I, want, I gotta ask a question. Because in my introduction, mm -hmm. I talked about this transition that you go through. Because what, what was powerful about the story that you told me was you were in your 40s when you decided to say, listen, acting and theater has been great. I've learned a lot, but there's just not enough of this. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then you made this transition. And I just want to I want to take some notes here because I think that it's key for the people listening. That while you were in your 40s, you decided to make a transition, but you did something that somebody had advised you to do, which was, look, Celia, I understand your challenge. I understand that you love drama, you love acting, you love theater, but it's not producing the kind of return on investment, if you will, that, 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 that you deserve or, or that you, you want to live with, sort of in a particular lifestyle. Exactly. So, so you said that one of the tools that you use was a simple piece of paper that said, what I want to do is, I, what, what I want you to do, Celia, is I want you to write the advantages and the disadvantages of the thing that you loved most. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and it was, it was, it was when I when I was able to do that course for teachers on how to use the web for teaching that I realized I needed more education. I, I, I couldn't go back to Vancouver to film school. I couldn't afford that at all. But I could go to OISE and get my doctorate. So while I worked full time at Seneca teaching, I worked part time at on a thesis on my proposals at the university. My first proposal was how to do playback theater in virtual reality, which um, I realized then was it was far too expensive to get virtual reality happening. <laughs> um, but I had seen some really amazing courses being taught at Arizona State University using that. Um, anyway, the chair at OISE when I was admitted said, um, Master of Fine Arts in Theater, why do you think you can do computer applications? Well, I think I can. I ended up doing twice as many courses as most people do for a doctorate. But one, one part of me has computer applications and the other part of me has holistic and arts-based studies. And I got the idea for my thesis to do something about how, how students were self-actualizing, taking my courses, working with computers, you being one of them. <laughs> so I had a party for the five semesters I had been teaching this course that you were in. And I called it Web Stars. And I invited any student who was interested in coming to this party. And I said, I'd like to interview you. I'd like for you to be one of my case studies 
because I want to I want to do a thesis about how students can come into your class and this is you know er, we are in the early days of technology in education and students are terrified not just about getting up in front of a class and doing a presentation they're terrified with the computer are they going to make a mistake are they going to you know break the computer or what so I interviewed 17 students, you being one of them, and I created what I think was, <laughs> um, it's it's um, a thesis I'm really proud of. At the same time, I, would, I had gone from yoga to qigong, and I began doing martial arts. And I found that doing martial arts helped me more than almost anything else when it came time to defend the work that I was doing. And I remember one, one particular time when we were, we were having a meeting with all the people who were on my committee and they were, you know, digging into everything I was doing. Because I had this strong warrior ridge pole and I knew how to breathe and I knew how to deflect negativity through my martial arts training, that got me through the hardest part of getting a doctorate. At the same time, because I was able to work, I didn't take any loans out. So when I finally graduated in 1999, I, am I in my 60s now? Uh, I have a doctorate. And uh, unbelievable, I, I, unbelievable. I I was going all over the place giving presentations about, for, for example, I, I didn't want marketing students to feel like they were rock stars and that as soon as they graduated, they were going to get these fabulous jobs. But what they had were transferable skills. They knew how to do time management. They knew how to work collaboratively with other students. They knew how to make good decisions. But they had the tools that they needed in order to go forward. And when you came back from Thailand and and you were in this, I don't know, big deal, quandary, what it, none of the jobs that you'd had so far were really turning you on, what could you do? I was so happy when you agreed to be one of the two students that I used to create a course about creating e-portfolios and reflecting and figuring out who you are and what it is you really want to do with your life. Okay, pause for a second, because what I want to know is I just want to go back a little bit, Celia, because I want to talk about 1996. I want to talk about walking into your class, and then we can we can fast forward. I want to know a little bit about that moment, because it's a moment that literally changed my life forever. Well, I learned a lot. I learned a lot teaching, and that's why I love teaching is because I love learning. But what I learned particularly in that first time I taught um, computer applications for marketing students in that classroom, it wasn't a lab. We had, we had um, equipment stacked up on textbooks. So I was using a whiteboard to try to demonstrate stuff. And unfortunately, I suggested that everyone create a web page. <laughs> I didn't realize that it was really important that the team, I put them in a team, in a group, because somebody in the group would probably know better than somebody else how to do something. So that by the time they got to do their own web page, web page or portfolio, they knew somebody who could help That's them. That's right, not just exactly. Me. So right now, this summer, for the 23rd time, I will be teaching holistic approaches to information technology online from here, right here, <laughs> from this office. And what has really worked well is the first project they do is with a the team. Then they have a learning partner they have to design a blended course on any topic. They can 
do it on running, cooking, I don't care. But they have to work with one other person in which to create a course on this topic. The teams, meanwhile, have to learn how to moderate discussions, and they also have to create an educational website. But from the very beginning of when they come to the course, and it's a 12-week course packed into six weeks in the summer, they have a forum where they can talk about the ideas they have for their own personal individual project. Now I ask them to keep, I ask them to keep um, like a journal or a diary while they're taking my course. Because at the end of the course, I want them to give me a reflective paper. It's not one where it's citation riddled bullshit. It's one where they talk about what they've learned in the course and what ideas they've gotten and how it's made them think about being a holistic educator, about using technology in a caring, loving way with their students. Because that's what holistic educators do. They're not they're the guide on the side. They're not the sage on the stage. They let wow. the students figure things out. Now, I, I want to make sure I get this in. I don't know how much time I have left, but I wrote down some highlights, hoping that some of these highlights will be helpful to somebody who's listening today. I keep a journal. I write every single night. It's sort of like the captain's log on the ship. You know what happened during the day. Uh, I use visualizations. I visualized living in this fabulous apartment I live in for a long time before I actually got the apartment. It's um, in the heart of Toronto in a fabulous neighborhood on Palmerston Boulevard, a beautiful street. And I'm grandfathered under rent control so I can still afford to be here. It's over a thousand square feet. I, I have a studio here. I have an office here. I also have two bedrooms, a kitchen, a bathroom, and a back porch. I mean, anyway, so I really advise visualizations, affirmations. I do affirmations all the time. You know, um, I remind myself all the time. A good place to do some affirmations is when you're taking a shower. Um, when you say, um, I am loving awareness, that's a really great mantra just to say to yourself. Take a deep breath and say, I am loving awareness. It was Ram Dass' favorite mantra. And Ram Dass has been my spiritual guide all these years. I've attended many of his talks, some of his workshops. I mean, he died at age 88, which I think is an ideal time to die. When I was 44, I said, okay, I'm halfway. <laughs> anyway, I also think that it's important to to try your hand at memoir writing. For 10 years now, I've been facilitating a memoir writing group in different libraries, two hours a week on different topics. We put topics in a canister, we pull one out, everyone writes for 15 minutes, and then we read our stories to each other. And during COVID, we did it on, by telephone. I, I, at noon, I would send them a topic, and by two o'clock, they could sign. They would come to the telephone, having written for fifteen minutes on that topic. Okay, um, I like to remember birthdays of friends, and so I have two e-card accounts: Jackie Lawson and um, Blue Mountain. And I try to find the best possible card to send somebody, not just for birthdays, but for, you know, if I know they're feeling down, I send them a cheer, cheer message or something. I read constantly, and I love to read books in series, just like when I was a little kid and my parents were too busy. I was busy reading. And now I've got 10 boxes of books written by authors where I've read everything they've written and they're ready to go to the Toronto Public Library to sell in the bookstore there. That's uh, a donation I, I'm happy to make. Qigong and martial arts practices have been incredibly important in giving me um, 
that strength, that stamina. So in the online course that I teach in the summer, I, I have a couple of links to 10 minute Qigong exercises just so that you can get up and take a break. <laughs> um, I continue developing Astral Sight and I think you, yeah, astralsight.com, right. If you go there, um, right now I think for April I've put The Fountain as my featured website. It has lots of links to contemplative spiritual teachers and leaders, and it also has a link to my spa. Um, when I took holistic curriculum, course at OISE in 1995 in the summer. I also took a course in the internet resources and I was the first student who ever turned in a website for my final project, not a paper. The, the project was Celia Spa where holistic educators can go to take a break. I also created a meditation garden so that you can go through the chakras from red up to violet and white. And, and it gives you time. And I took all the pictures of the flowers that represent that garden meditation. And it's been used by new teachers for the Catholic school board, um, places like that. Um, when I teach, I teach to go for the gold. I don't like using rubrics because it suggests that you might be interested in a B, C, D, one of those kind of courses. Uh, everybody starts with 100 points. <laughs> everybody. And everybody has the op. I don't, I don't work on the curve thing, you know. If I want to give 10 people an A+, plus, I will if they've all earned it. But you have to earn it. But I tell you how. <laughs> I, give you, I give you all the inspiration, all the guidelines, all the... You can email me anytime behind the scenes. I'll help you uh, any way you want help. I'll give it to you. The other thing is love what you do. You never have to work a day in your life. I like that saying, and that's how I feel. And if, if you can, maybe choose a symbol. I think behind me you can see a little star. My apartment is full of five-pointed stars. And if you go to Astral Sight, you'll see a saying, you know, that if, if there is a light on the path to help you get through life, and if it's starlight, that's fine. It's, it's. Can you see this, Celia? Yeah, I can see it. And just below the stars is the saying. To be a star, you must shine your own light, follow your own path, and don't worry about the darkness, for that is when stars shine the brightest. And I try to live by that. Um, also yeah. on Astral Sight, on that homepage, you can go to my course. The information website is Holistic Approaches to Information Technology. Um, you can see projects I've done awards that I've won, um, the memoir writers, all the topics for the last 10 years that we've written about. There's my art school blog for three years. You know, I had to retire at 65 because my birthday was before they changed the law so that I could keep teaching. I missed the, the change by 11 days so oh that I God. had to retire. And I thought, oh, good. I've always wanted to be an artist. I'll go to art school. So I At 65. Yeah. Amazing. So from 2007 to 2010, I was a student in the adult art program at Central Tech. And I kept that blog because I was also observing my teachers and whether or not they were holistic. <laughs> and if they weren't, I mean, I remember one project I worked so hard on. I mean, here... Mervish Village had lots of wonderful shops and things, and I did a video and a presentation on that. And the teacher sat at his desk going through a drawer or something. I, I thought it was like a squirrel looking for his nuts. Behind him on the screen was my fucking project. <laughs> I 
anyway, the last thing I said was use PowerPoint to plan and organize. And so that's what I've done today. I started off with my, my title slide, which is Coffee and Biscotti, talking about my life with Mel Lewis on April 1st, and then some notes to remind me about the first thing I wanted to say. And then I did one on, uh, let's see, Toronto teaching, about Greece, about the 60s, and being a hippie, about the early years growing up in Hot Springs and then with my grandparents. And this is highlights. This is the one I've just talked to you about. Listen, if you're watching the show, um, I have to tell you, I do take ginkgo biloba, which is for memory. Uh, and I've stopped being someone who has who gets up out of their chair and leaves the room to get something and then has to go back and sit back down at the chair again to f figure out why they got up out of the chair. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I just, if I can't remember something, I just say, oh, okay, I can't remember that right now. I'll get to it later because it's in my Rolodex somewhere and, and it will float to my, <laughs> to my uh, awareness sometime later. And I do take deep breaths and I say, I am loving awareness. Well, I wanted to show a little bit, uh, Celia, if I could. I'm going to bring this thing. Josh, you let me know if you guys can see this. But here is the page that in 2003, there you go, Celia. There's the picture right there. Can you guys see that? This is the only time publicly I'm going to show this picture. Josh, can you see that? There you go. That was at uh, 26 years old right here. A picture that went to a calendar in Jamaica. Um, this was a, a picture that I took um, right before I went to fight in Marquette, Michigan. And I was 170 pounds, and I was, needless to say, in good shape. Right. And those two pictures that were on either side, and that one at the bottom, those are all pictures that I took of you. Correct. Correct. <laughs> put on your e-portfolio. That's right. So I share this with all of you because, Celia, there's so much to, there's so much to unpack uh, about it, you know? about your story and and all i can say is is that you have again outdone yourself by entertaining us for almost 90 minutes uh, i hope i hope inspired really yes and inspire of course i mean that's the that's the beauty and, and i will i we still i will say this silly that i say this every show that the gentleman in the chat, Putin Nation, Josh Leslie, was the one that that inspired me to come on and 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 come on to Twitch and say, you know, that that I needed to have a platform. And what I decided to do was, he sort of gave the analogy that this platform Twitch was kind of like being at a bar versus a disco. If you went to a disco, the bartenders, uh, you know, you 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 sort of go to a disco. Nobody knows your name. They just want to sell you drinks and get out. Whereas this platform was like a, a bar, like a cheers, where everybody knows your name. And I said, well, listen, Josh, I don't drink alcohol. So, but I said, I've always wanted to own a coffee shop. He said, perfect. So let's open up a coffee shop. <laughs> and he says, let's, so what are we going to call it? I guess we're going to call it the Coffee and Biscotti Show. And I said, the reason why I wanted to do this, because I always dreamed about one day retiring in a in a tropical climate being the guy with my little cheese cutters hat you know selling coffees and talking about my life experience uh to the world uh, uh over over a cup of coffee or over some nice teas and i did this because i wanted to share people's stories of passions and transformations we've had some incredible guests on the show over the last year and Certainly, Silio, that listening to your story and to stuff that I didn't even know from, from all the years that we've been friends, um, um, you know, stuff that I didn't know, 
about your what your life was about and and the the, the different twists and turns it's 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 it so totally resonates with me because you said something when I came back from Thailand in 2003, we got together, we did this e-portfolio, but you basically said, not even an hour ago, that I was stuck. I, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had been a baker, a travel agent, a florist, a construction worker. I worked in the restaurant business for eight years. Um, I, I, I mean, I worked for Coca-Cola, which my mother thought was the, the greatest thing on earth, turned out to be one of the most horrific experiences of my life. They said I was a, they said I was a circle in a square. I certainly didn't fit the corporate mold. And listening to your story is, is, is nothing short of in, in, inspiring because one of the things that I truly love about you, Silly, is that you always did what you love. And you said to anybody else who had something to say about it. You don't like what I'm doing here. Let me get, hold on, let me get something in my pocket for you. That's what I love about this. That's what I love about you. You've always done, you were always working towards being in your zone of genius because you led with your heart. That's a lot of it, you know. Um, I, I just, I remember that when I came back from Greece, and I was told that my play was not acceptable. I had three months to go. I went around the corner from the Dallas Theater Center. It was a 24-hour Greek restaurant. In Greek, I said, I need a job. Can I work for you? The next day, I started serving coffee and donuts by day, taking speed and writing a new thesis by night. Um, it was incredible. And, and when I... I flew to San Antonio to put my thesis on the desk of whoever the hell it had to be on the final day of my deadline. And then I went out to California where my dad was living with his, with my stepmom and a daughter. And I wanted to be near, I wanted to get to know my dad. So San Francisco was just across, he was in Contra Costa County. And San Francisco was just across the bay. And my stepmom was working there. So I saw a job notice for um, a secretary for the producer of the Curran Theater and the Golden Gate Theaters. And so I went and I got the job. And the woman who went for the job administrative assistant, I watched her her first day on the job. I knew she was a fucking disaster. She didn't have a clue. So I went to the producer, Carol Shorenstein. Her dad, by the way, probably owns half of San Francisco. Um, and I said, Carol, I can do that job for you, no problem. And the next day, I became the administrative assistant to one of the most powerful women in San Francisco. I mean, uh, she had a bodyguard, and she had a really good Jaguar, and and she had a major domo. And she, and unfortunately, she had a bad habit of taking speed, um, so she was a little unpredictable. But, you know, she was on the phone with um, all the stars all the time, getting things ready, because the Golden Gate Theater was going to be reopening with the best of Broadway. James Niederlander, major producer out of New York City was behind the whole situation. I think I lasted longer than anybody who ever worked for Carol. But it was a wonderful way to use my knowledge. I mean, I had worked, you know, as I told you, at Playhouse Theater Company, all those jobs. It, it was a way to be near my dad to learn about him and his wife and his daughter. But it was also... It validated me. <laughs> I needed the money too. I'd had to borrow some money from somebody to buy a, a typewriter to type my thesis. <laughs> I mean, I, I was really broke when I came back from Greece. But, you know, it's these things, you know, you have to be even in your, in your lowest period of time, 
you have to stay open for opportunities and you have to be able to recognize them when they come along and take advantage of them and step right in be ready for me teaching is a service it allows me to be of service to humanity to mankind to womankind to every kind of kind <laughs> you know um and happily i love it i love doing this so i, I feel really fortunate that whenever there's been an opportunity and I've needed something, I've been ready to take the risk, do it. I don't have any family in Canada. I have very few, very little family left. My stepmom died two years ago at the age of 99. And one of the most valuable things she gave me was a love for the NFL. Man, I became a 49ers fan like you won't believe. Um, I, <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, because I was typing up preseason and then month by month, every game that was being played, what time it was being played, where it was being played, to send to her so that we didn't have to talk about what Meals on Wheels brought her or what was hurting or, you know, if she was able to sleep last night. No, we talked about quarterbacks. <laughs> and we talked about the game and about how exciting it was. I mean, I have to tell you that I I am still a 49ers fan, but I'm also a Green Bay Packer fan. <laughs> and I, I'm grateful. I can see now. I can understand. I can appreciate why people get so hung up on sports. I mean, I did go to baseball games with my grandfather, um, the Bears in Texarkana. I've went, once I went to a hockey game in Vancouver with a landlord. <laughs> I just, I do the things. <laughs> now, I've been here, I have been what I think of as bushed. I had COVID in February of 2020 and I've had all the shots. I wear a double mask when I go out. I don't go into places where there's many people because I'm old. I'm vulnerable. I've had six major surgeries, but I'm still alive. I'm a bionic woman and I can't. my mind is still okay. Holy shit. Okay. You're 80 years old, silly. I mean, like, I don't think okay is the word. I think magnificent, <laughs> fantastic, fantabulous is the word. But anyway, here we are, Mo. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, it, it was really tremendous. Um, I, I discovered as I was going through some papers, a letter. I think I told you I, about this letter. It was from a student in 1997 who said, my life has totally changed. Your course has helped launch me into the real world, all the way from PowerPoint presentations to designing web pages. It's a great course. The format's excellent. If you need my assistance in any way, please let me know. I'll be glad to help. Isn't that a wonderful thing for a student to tell you that not only did they really were they really appreciating your course, but now they would be willing to help you. And I'm willing to help you in any way that I can, Mel. <laughs> so you know that. And you've always known that all these years. And I hope this has been helpful to be on your wonderful show. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you, Celia, that, you know, to conclude, uh, you know, I, I have to say that how, 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 what's left to, what's left to explain other than walking into some class in Seneca College, meeting a woman who was teaching the class, connecting with her in a way that few students connect with their teachers. I want to bring some light to that before we go, because, you know, that's, that's something that was very powerful. For all of you that are in university, that have gone to university or college, I want you to think back to your professors and think back to, um, you know, 
what kind of connection you had? Who were the influencers in your life? Well, there's even fewer people, Celia, who will get the opportunity to sit down and spend 90 minutes with a woman who was, was, was the most influential woman of my life. That to me is something so special. It's an honor for me to be your friend, an absolute honor. And it has been all this time. If I had to say, have you ever had a favorite student? I have to say, I still have one. Yep. And if I ever had a favorite teacher, the moderator who helped me on the show before, her name was Rosie Tozy, Emma Rose. She did something uh, for um, Teachers Week, and she asked me to do a video about my favorite teacher. And in that video that I sent to you, I spoke about a woman, uh, and her name is Dr. Celia Karsten. And here she is today on the show. Um, Celia, you, when you call me Dr. Love. <laughs> Dr. Love, baby! <laughs> Well, we won't get into Uncle Potty and tossing carrots today, but... No, but we've had some good times. <laughs> but and we've we had some... continue to have good times. Indeed we and will. I'll be celebrating your success every single day. Celia, I love you very much, dear. Epesis, as they say in Greek. Thank you for Same to you. all your energy, all your love. We were concerned yesterday. You flew through 90 minutes. No problem. Well, I, I'm hoping that I was able to be in some way an inspiration to anybody at whatever stage they're at. Uh, just it's really important to trust yourself and to, and to, to use I statements, that is, when things are going on around you, not to be judgmental, just witness, observe what's going on. Absolutely. And, and send as much unconditional love to the situation as you can possibly manage. Well, you certainly got some love in the chat, Celia, today from a couple of my dear friends, Sandra Mio, who says, I will be sure to connect with you for a cup of tea. She's in Toronto, uh, Celia. She's a, a very, very dear friend of mine. I've known her since I was 15 years old. And, uh, and she's a, an incredible, incredible woman. So I'm glad that you'll get in touch with her. Uh, certainly, of course, everyone who came on to the show. Um, uh, smiling, well, smiling Spirits, thank you so much for joining us. If I go us. to astralsight.com, my email address is right there. Absolutely. We've got that in the chat. Astralsight.com. Make sure you go and visit the website so you can get in contact with uh, who I call Dr. Love. Dr. Love. Celia, I'm going to put you into the green room as I give my final thoughts for today. Thank you so much. I love you. I love you too. Thank you. As my yoga teacher would say, uh, no more stay. <laughs> what a clarity coach this man is. <laughs> I love it. Here we go. Whew. I was trying to get through this show without shedding any tears, and she almost had me break at the end of the show, I'll tell you. You know, my friends, if you're watching this now or the recorded version of this, I've been very blessed in my life that with whatever cards that I've been dealt with, which haven't been all very good cards, the one thing that the universe has provided me was an opportunity to meet some incredible people in my life. I want you to understand, guys, that I was a 21-year-old kid walking into Dr. Celia Karsten's class thinking that I was the who's who of anybody. She, I just thought that I was the cat's meow. And here was this woman who, every moment she stood in front of her class, shined her light. 
and as much of my ego was there, I still recognized and saw the light. And however many years later it is from 1996, because my math is bad, I'm honored to call this woman a friend. She is really a remarkable woman. <laughs> Thank you, Putin Nation. Thank you, Putin Nation. You're very kind, my friend, very kind. Um, but I just have to say, guys, today was a special episode for me. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for all those in the, uh, in the, in the chat that joined me today. <sighs> thank you to Sandra Mio, to Charlene, to Josh Leslie for making it a special day for me. This has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. So I look forward to seeing you next week on the Coffee and Biscotti Show. I'm not going to tell you who the guest is. You're just going to have to come and find out. You're just going to have to come and see me next week at 12 o'clock EDT. Mr. Leslie, let us know where we are rating to this week. Wherever you are, my friends, I hope you have an awesome Friday and an even awesomer weekend. It has been my pleasure and my honor to be here with you. I hope that uh, you take some of this. Go and write down your lists of advantages and disadvantages of what you're doing now so that you can go and see what it is that moves you to what you're doing. And then maybe even moves you to try something new. To get you closer to what we call your zone of genius. Today we're off to see, off to St. Catharines to, win, win, to visit one of the best video DJs in Canada, DJ Tanner. So stick around folks for some musical entertainment. This is Crew Mel signing off. I'm out of here. Have an awesome Friday. Peace.